Welcome. So this is uh, the third part to Chapter 18. So this is going to take a look at exchange rate regimes again and take a closer look at some of the uh, benefits and also the limitations that exchange rate regimes um, face. And so one of the things that we talked about in a previous um, video is this issue of if we have fixed exchange rates um, with an overvalued currency, then this persistently overvalued currency can lead to speculative attacks. And the basic mechanics of that was such that with an overvalued currency, the central bank is going to force, be forced to buy up domestic currency by drawing down its, its uh, uh, amount of international reserves that it holds. And so eventually it could run out of those international reserves. And so it would either be forced to stop defending the peg in the event that it would be worried about running out of international reserves, or it would just flat out run out of these reserves. And when that happens, you're going to see, you would see a sharp currency devaluation in that case. And so that can lead to what's referred to as sudden stops or these balance of payments crises where um, the central bank doesn't have the ability to um, provide international reserves to other central banks um, to make uh, capital flows occur. And um, that can be really problematic for a variety of reasons. That can lead to capital flight, for instance, um, when you have these, these sharp devaluations. Um, you can, it can lead to uh, a sharp increase in debt denominated in dollar or hard currency terms through this currency mismatch. Um, and so ultimately the question is, well, can speculative attacks be avoided, right? Uh, if we have these overvalued pegs, then you know, we want to maintain them, but is there ways that we can get around that that are, are going to avoid these speculative attacks and the possibility that the central bank has to constantly intervene uh, to defend these, um, these, these pegs? And so one way that you can do that is through controlling the amount of capital flows that come into and out of the country. Um, and so, for instance, we can look at capital outflows. Um, and, and so if the central bank or the government, rather, is controlling the amount of uh, capital that's flowing out of the economy, then that can actually um, have beneficial impacts because, of course, it can mitigate, it can mitigate this capital flight, which helps mitigate um, a balance of payment crisis that could occur um, from sudden stops um, in this capital flight. Um, the disadvantage, though, is that capital controls are often ineffective. One of the reasons why is because um, the private sector is pretty uh, smart about these things, and often ways there's, there's ways around these um, formal capital controls. And the private sector will find them when they're trying to um, do what's best in their own interest. Um, and on top of that, it turns out in a lot of cases, capital flight can increase after these controls actually come into place precisely because um, investors and people in the economy get worried about what the government is going to do, and that accelerates this process of trying to find ways around these, um, these capital controls. And in addition to this, these capital controls can lead to cor uh, corruption in a lot of cases, especially in emerging market uh, countries and countries with weak political institutions, um, incentives for uh, politicians and um, policymakers to look the other way um, or be bribed to um, allow capital uh, flight to occur um, could be problematic. Um, and the other aspect of this is that if the government is putting capital controls in place, then that can create um, a misalignment of incentives in order for the government to really address the fundamental underlying problems of the economy. Um, and so it can pull uh, resources away from the, 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 the needed reforms that need to take place in the economy. The flip side of this is that we can control the inflow of capital. Um, it's for a lot of the same arguments, it has the same advantages and disadvantages. Um, if we control the amount of capital that's coming into the country, then that can later on mitigate the potential for asset price bubbles, uh, lending booms, and speculative attacks that we, uh, we talked about. Um, the disadvantages are, uh, again, the same as what we talked about before. They're often ineffective. The, central, the private sector finds ways around them. It can lead to corruption. And it also can block productive capital from entering the economy. So again, um, we can think of uh, sort of uh, speculative capital that comes in to try to profit off of um, uh, the, the situation in the economy. They're going to run at the first sight of, of blood, so to speak. Um, but there may be productive capital that comes in um, that can actually be beneficial. And so capital controls often don't discriminate between this sort of speculative capital that can come in versus productive capital. So ultimately, the question is, should we peg or should we not peg as a country? Um, on the one hand, intervention means the monetary base can be affected. Um, 
we, if we tie policy to other currency, again, that usually means that we're giving up our independence of monetary policy to address uh, domestic shocks that occur in the economy. Um, pegs, as we've seen, can lead to balance of payments crises if they're not properly aligned to fundamentals in a sustainable manner. Um, and so the, the, the overriding thing that we've talked about before with exchange rates is that it can have substantial impacts on the trade flows because pegs can provide certainty over the value of those flows. Um, and this is particularly important for emerging market countries or smaller countries. Um, it can provide favorable exchange rate um, terms and that can impact production and employment for particular industries. And exchange, uh, for, for these reasons, exchange rate policy can be highly politicized in some cases. So the advantages of exchange rate targeting, um, so there's several. But first of all, the, the, a peg provides a nominal anchor, and that helps keep inflation low. So the idea here is that if we were a country and we're trying to peg to uh, an anchor country that has uh, low inflation, well, that can sort of impl import this low inflation monetary policy regime. And so in that sense, it ties the hands of policymakers and helps them avoid inflationary monetary policy as long as that, cre that peg is credibly maintained. And in addition to this, we can think of the ex the, a peg as an exchange rate rule. And so that helps eliminate uh, the timing consistency problem that we've talked about in previous videos. So the idea here is simply that the, a credible peg, if, if a, um, a government or a central bank is credibly committed to the peg, then that's going to preclude this temptation by policymakers uh, to deviate from this low inflation uh, regime. And so the, the basic idea of this is simply that monetary policy is focusing on maintaining the peg, not on driving down unemployment that could potentially have um, inflationary um, implications later on. The third point is that an exchange rate is really clear and transparent. You can see exactly how the exchange rate is behaving, and you can verify pretty easily whether or not the central bank is maintaining that exchange rate peg. Um, and so it's easy to, to verify whether or not we have the peg and, and by proxy whether or not these low inflation policies are being adhered to. And of course, it's also an easy way to quickly reduce inflation. So if you're a country that has a history of high inflation, then you can reduce inflation expectations really quickly by simply adopting a peg and pegging that to uh, an anchor country that has a low inflation um, a low inflation monetary policy regime. And so for that reason, you see a lot of emerging market com countries pegging their currency to the U.S. dollar or other uh, large industrialized countries. Some of the disadvantages of exchange rate targeting, um, we've talked about these before. With free capital mobility, it turns out you can't use monetary policy to stabilize domestic shocks. And again, the basic motivation for that is that policy is focused on maintaining the peg, and so it can't simultaneously do both at the same time as we talked about with this policy trilemma. Um, in addition to that, with a peg, you can transmit shocks from an anchor country to a domestic currency, uh, a domestic country. So you can imagine a situation where if inflation is rising in the anchor country and at the same time uh, the economy is weak in the domestic uh, country, well, what's going to happen is the anchor country is going to be forced to raise rates because inflation is rising, and that's just how you deal with higher inflation. And so as a result, if the domestic, the pegging country wants to maintain that peg, they're going to be forced to raise interest rates. And so as they raise that interest rates, the domestic economy could become more weak or be pushed into a recession um, as, a, as a result. Uh, as we talked about previously, um, Countries that peg are susceptible, uh, say that three times quickly, uh, to speculative attacks. They're also susceptible to these sudden stops, balance of payments, and financial crises, um, as we talked about previously. Um, and so this commitment by the central bank to pegging is really crucial because if the, the central bank is not really credibly committed, if their the commitment is very weak to the peg, then that can increase this uh, possibility of speculative attacks, and it can uh, be really robust if the commitment is really weak. Um, and so as a result of this, um, if policymakers, uh, policymakers can find themselves in this situation where they have a choice, um, a choice between two really bad outcomes. Um, on, on the one hand, faced with the, these, these speculative attacks, they can either abandon the peg. And so if they abandon the peg altogether, then you have this sharp devaluation um, and all sorts of other problems. 
Um, on the other, and, and that of course also ruins the credibility of the central bank in maintaining that peg and, and can impact inflation, long-term inflation expectations. Um, on the other hand, they can um, contract the economy by raising interest rates and continuing with the strong stance against the speculative attack. And so that has implications for uh, really um, creating economic problems domestically. Um, so <clears throat> in addition to this, the, uh, one of the disadvantages is simply that this can weaken the accountability of policymakers if we have a peg in the sense that a lot of times exchange rates are uh, the, the first and foremost mechanism in which we can identify potential problems in the economy, particularly for smaller and emerging market countries. So in other words, the exchange rate can act as a canary in the coal mine, so to speak, in identifying financial or, uh, imbalances or fiscal imbalances in the economy. And so by intervening in that, that distorts that signal um, that people can get uh, that something is potentially wrong, fundamentally wrong with the, the economy. And the second point is that central banks can just be more transparent um, uh, or sophisticated enough. They, they, don't, they don't have the sophisticated knowledge to be able to recognize um, uh, the, the signs that problems could be uh, going on in the economy if they have this exchange rate and it's basically fixed or constant. Um, and in addition to that, you can have the public becoming complacent. They don't really uh, think about the exchange rate because it's pegged, and so they don't really scrutinize uh, it, it, uh, the policies that are put in place as a result. So the, the fundamental question there is, well, again, should we peg or should we not peg? If we think about industrialized countries, they might want to peg for a couple of different reasons. So first of all, if they have a history of poor monetary policy, um, if they have significant trade with neighboring countries, um, again, this could take the form of a formal currency union, uh, for instance, the European Monetary Union and the ECB that we see in the euro area. Um, or they should also peg if we, they don't have to worry significantly about domestic shocks um, or about giving up their domestic monetary policy. If countries are comfortable with that, then why not peg? Um, in terms of emerging market countries, the answers are somewhat similar. Countries should peg if they have weak political institutions, which is often the case in emerging market countries, but not always. Um, if they have a history, again, of poor monetary policy, history or performance, high inflation, um, or if they desire to have certainty over uh, their trade flows. And so the, the final question here is to think about, well, what are the mechanics of this? How can we actually do that? Well, um, there's what we refer to as a de facto exchange rate peg. I think I referred to this previously as a, the standard um, exchange rate peg. The basic idea here is that the exchange rate peg is defined, it's clear, and it's verifiable. But the important part is that there's no formal commitment me mechanism here. So the central bank can declare that this is going to be their peg, or the, the government more generally, this is our peg, um, but there's no, nothing that binds them to that, and they can abandon that at any time. Um, and so as we've talked about before, if the commitment to that peg is weak enough, then that could open up the possibility of speculative attacks um, and cause problems later on. Um, and so there's a stronger form of a peg that can be instituted, which is referred to as a currency board. And the basic idea of a currency board is that you have the central bank or the government stands ready at any time to have 100% convertibility to um, an anchor currency. And so the basic idea is that you can have domestic currency um, circulating through the economy with the anchor country uh, currency as well. And the central bank is going to be uh, formally committed to exchanging on a one-for-one -one basis their domestic currency with the foreign, uh, the anchor currency. And so the, the, the basic idea here is that it, it's a stronger form of a peg. Um, and it, um, and the important part, of course, is that it precludes this discretionary or, in, excuse me, inflationary use of monetary policy. And that has uh, beneficial impacts for anchoring inflation expectations. Um, and in, in addition to this, because we have this stronger form uh, and more transparent form of a peg with greater commitment, that can significant, significantly reduce the probability that the country would be susceptible to these speculative attacks. Um, but there are disadvantages to this. So first of all, there's a big loss of independent monetary policy. Uh, as with all pegs, um, it becomes a little bit more uh, of a loss with this currency board. In addition to that, you can see, uh, again, you have this situation where you can have uh, shocks transmitted from a current, uh, an anchor country to the domestic country. Um, 
In addition to this, speculative attacks really require a strong reaction um, to keep that convertibility intact. Um, and because of that, they can suffer more sharp uh, contractions than under a de, vac de facto peg where they can at some point just walk away. Um, and then the other important part here is that under a currency board, there's no lender of last resort. Because the central bank is committed to this 100% con convertibility, they don't have the ability to inject uh, money into failing banks um, because that would blow away this convertibility. Now, there's one more, more form of, of a peg that's a little bit stronger, and that's what's referred to as dollarization. And so the basic idea here is that the country essentially abandons its own currency and allows an anchor currency to circulate as the official currency. So you can imagine a situation um, uh, where U.S. dollars would be the currency that, that sit, uh, circulates in, say, Zimbabwe or something like that. Um, and so this is the strongest possible peg that you can have. And the basic idea is that the currency board is um, uh, uh, the basic distinguishing feature between a currency board and the dollarization is that under a currency board, you can still abandon it. At some point, the currency board can walk away and say, we're no longer supporting this convertibility of the domestic currency to the anchor currency. It turns out the dollarization is harder to abandon um, for practical reasons. So first of all, if you abandon your uh, own currency, then basically you're not printing your own currency, you don't have the mechanisms to set up um, and distribute the currency, and you don't have the monetary policy framework in place. And so it's really hard once you dollarize to actually abandon that system. And so because it's harder to abandon it, it's a stronger form of a peg, and it, if, in addition to that, it completely avoids the possibility of a speculative attack simply because you don't have your own currency. So uh, speculators can't, um, you know, speculate on whether or not the, um, the value of those currencies are going to go up or down. So the disadvantages are the same as the currency board in this case, um, but in addition to that, there's no ability to print the currency, and because of that, you can't have um, seniorage revenue uh, generated for the central bank. So seniorage revenue is simply the ability to print currency, and that printing of currency is, is a, a form of revenue. Uh, for the central bank and, and the government. So obviously, if you don't have your own currency, you don't uh, you aren't able to generate revenue in that in that sense. Thank you.